to my website, www.susanneeling.com. The link will be in the description of the information. So, I'm Susan Neeling, also known as Lady Dory Bell. Same person. I'm a reverend. I'm an ordained reverend. I've gone over this a time or two. So, I'll go over brats before I continue on because of certain things. So, in the BDSM lifestyle, there are these things called brats. You've seen them before. They're annoying. They, um, you, you can look in reference to some generalized videos in regards of the, what is known as the vanilla aspect, where they cry for absolutely no reason, no cause, or no excuse. They have nothing that actually is of value or importance in regards of why they have to, in their opinions, express their feelings in comparison. So in the BDSM lifestyle, when brats show up, they don't care about who they impact. They purposefully do things to cause harm in comparison to ever being helpful, to ever being assistive, to ever having any consideration for anybody else. Brats are individuals in the lifestyle that I personally just don't have patience for in the slightest. If you are not willing to take other people's feelings into consideration, but you want attention in that regard, how you, in reference of the BDSM lifestyle, where there is no assistance whatsoever, there's no actual mature discussions about anything where you only want the attention in your bratty way in comparison to having a background that actually can be helpful, that actually can be assistive, that can actually inform. I don't have patience for that. It's a reality. I haven't ever had patience for individuals who have refused to actually educate themselves. That is another key factor in reference to brats, where they tend to think that they are more important even though they don't have a background that can actually be assistive. They don't have the intellect to discern certain factors, they tend to act as children only being biological adults. They don't have to dress a certain way, as you can see in the vanilla factor. They could be dressed in professional clothing and act as a brat. I don't have patience for brats at all, whatsoever. The reason it stems, in my opinion, regarding my lack of patience for brats has to do with my ex-sister-in-law's eldest daughter, who was literally nicknamed Brie Brat. And in that reference, in those regards, Brie Brat was just exactly as her nickname sounded. She had no education regarding when she spouted off her opinion. She didn't read books. She didn't study. She was the stereotypical millennial in full form where she thought she knew things and then only after her making a mistake would she ever look for any possibility of information and even then she wouldn't actually listen to the information or read it correctly. And because of that grouping of experiences, I just did not have any patience at any point in time for brats at all. The irony is my now dead ex-husband, who's my son and my daughter's biological father, which is Bree Brat's dead uncle, he couldn't stand her. 
He was annoyed by her. The irony is I had made attempts to calm his temper. I dealt with conversations over her in reference to various factors. She had been the stereotypical brat who didn't have any actual, um, what is it called? Um, she didn't have any inclination in her at those times to have any consistency. Her mother, my ex-sister-in-law, Susie Marie Nichols Lopez, back in those years of 2000 through to 2009, the last time I really had much to do, or 2010 in some ways, she didn't ever discipline Brianna or Brie Brat or Brianna Marie Nichols Lopez was her name at that time. She did not take the time to ever explain anything to her daughter. She didn't, all she was was realistically just abusive in many ways. And instead of actually taking the time to do what was needed, she didn't handle the situations correctly. And so fast forward to the time frame when my son and my daughter, their biological father died. The problems that came from Brie Brat were multifaceted, unnecessary, and her mother, my ex-sister-in-law, just didn't do anything to stop it. So I took care of it where I could. So her baby daddy, meaning Brie Brat's baby daddy for her first child, had worked at the Fort Worth Zoo. And when, in reference to my daughter having had the field trip through McCoy Elementary School of Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District, I had made the choice not to sue anyone, even though all of my ex-in-laws, meaning in reference to in Fort Worth, Texas, my ex-mother-in-law, my ex-sister-in-law, as well as my ex-sister-in-law's eldest daughter and the baby daddy had made the recommendation for me to sue the Fort Worth Zoo, as well as for me to sue McCoy Elementary School and Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District. I made the choice not to, because I didn't believe at that point in time that it was fully all of their fault. I believed that there were extenuating circumstances that needed to be gotten to the root of the actual situations, the actual causes in those references. Brie Brat being a typical millennial, she actually was born in the time frame to be considered a millennial, had acted, that's hence the term Brie Brat, as a brat. So in the BDSM lifestyle, those who understand brats, they show up to events, they have absolutely no background whatsoever. Not necessarily in the BDSM format, just they don't have a background in anything. They have a life that they've lived, but they don't have experience. And they usually want someone to discipline them, and then they don't care about certain things. As a leather dominant female, I just have not ever had any patience for those types. When I had officially, as a biological adult, gotten involved in the lifestyle, I made sure to educate myself. I made sure to go to classes and demos. I made sure to read books that were recommended to me to read. And it was extremely informative. 
I have the aspects in regards of certain memories before my head injury on Palm Sunday in 2000 and all of those factors, but I do not have patience for breaths. I grew up with my biological sister. That was enough. I didn't need anything further than that. That was enough for me to not like breaths whatsoever. So if you take a look at my journal blog, The Ornery PSA, on my website, www.susanmeeling, you can find a few references that I have gone over in that regard. Brats also tend to not care who they impact. Brats tend to also not take into consideration what is actually important. They also tend to not care about who they impact. They have no wherewithal of any assistive aspects. They have no intellect to actually assist with explaining anything. They don't have the background that is actually required. Now, in reference to the BDSM lifestyle, what was not necessarily known back more specifically to the years of 2008 through 2012 is that I had a background far longer than anybody knew. So most people in the lifestyle during the years of 2008 through 2012 had known me as Lady Dorybell. However, there's the years of 2004 and 2005 where I was known as Susan Mee Ling, which is my author name, my website name. I've gone by that name far longer, e even before my head injury on Palm Sunday in 2000. I didn't have my hair this way in 2004 or 2005. I didn't have my tattoos. So the only way that you would actually be able to recognize me in a overall way is when you take in consideration how I have been in Club Sapphire in the years of 2015 through 2018 mainly. And so for those who know how I have been in Club Sapphire, meaning I had volunteered, I had helped clean up, uh, regarding different messes, so I'd get the towels out and wipe up spills from people who had a little bit too much to drink. Or I'd go and get the DJ something to drink or eat, so that way they had what they needed. I'd go check on the front staff at the front office area, so that way if they needed anything, they were taken care of. I assisted with, you know, walking the perimeter and seeing if there was anything that needed to be paid attention to. Not necessarily an official security aspect, but I had noticed certain things. Um, and, you know, especially, especially females in Club Sapphire in regards to the back area, that was normal for me in 2004 and 2005, despite not looking the way I did. And so for the reference points, regarding the city of San Antonio, Texas, or Military City USA, when at specifically swinger events, that's pretty much how I had been. Just with longer hair, dark brown hair, no tattoos, usually in a dress, compared to my outfits. And then I had a pair of cute heels. That was it. That was so, you know, but because of the fact that the swinging community is known to have alcohol more so than the BDSM community, whether or not people remember me from that point in time would be different. However, certain events, specifically in 2012, regarding the swinging community in San Antonio, Texas, that was, that was exactly how I was in 2004 and 2005. I just didn't have my hairstyle the way it is, and I didn't wear corsets. I wore usually, once again, usually a dress. Usually it was a black dress or a solid color dress and heels. I sometimes wore 
jewelry-ish, but not really too much. I usually wore several rings on my hands. I was born and raised in New Jersey. I'm just gonna leave it at that. And so, <laughs> I did get moved from New Jersey at the age of 15 and three quarters years old, and I was still a virgin. I'm gonna leave it at, I had rings on. I was able to keep myself safe. So that is my reference point. However, by the time of 2008 through 2012, I just didn't need rings anymore. <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> it just wasn't a problem. It was kind of known ish to a degree that I'm just a dominant leather female. I'm pansexual, yeah, but dominant leather female. And it wasn't really known, especially back in those years from 2000 to 2013, it was not known as to my exposure to the adult lifestyle. Um, being born and raised in New Jersey and not just staying in the area that I was growing up in, I went to the five boroughs. My biological father had business. And so um, he had gone to the school of Bulba. He did jewelry repair and watch repair. And I could make a joke. It's not that he didn't know how to defend himself, but I can make a joke. <laughs> There's a reason why I don't need to wear rings anymore, because I may have hypothetically grown up as that ringer type. And so, you know, like track and fields. And so it is what it is. I did what I could do, but I also knew not to ride the coattails of somebody else. And so in those areas, I was known mainly as Susan or Susan Me Ling, but I had my nicknames, you know, like usually it was Shorty <laughs> or, or, you know, whatever. Anyway, or cuz, but that just is what it is. So. I very much know the difference between the BDSM lifestyle and the swinger lifestyle because certain aspects of the two lifestyles are very different, but they're very similar. The BDSM lifestyle, there is the expectation of you being truthful just as much, but very much more in the swinger lifestyle. The swinger lifestyle expects it far more than the BDSM lifestyle in certain references because when you show up in the BDSM lifestyle, if you choose to have a particular theme for your self during an event, you know, some people show up as a brat at one event and then show up as a switch as another event and then a they little and they have those different aspects. In the BDSM lifestyle, I just showed up as myself. I, I didn't really need those labels. Um, there were others who wanted explanations as to who I am. And, okay, I'm a dominant leather, female, pansexual, open-minded, spiritual individual who is an ordained reverend that does a bunch of stuff and I'm a mom. And I was in the army, I'm medically retired. <laughs> you see how that list could go on and on and on and on and on. So in a lot of ways, when I entered the BDSM lifestyle, I did enter by the technicalities of in more of a swinger mindset, especially when you take into the consideration that swingers have that particular thought process where it's just you come as you are. 
you are yourself, it's expected to be in truth. It's, it's it, the minimum is you're being truthful as to who you are. You are being truthful as to your background. That's the minimum. And so in reference to the BDSM lifestyle, I believe that there's a lot of problems between the BDSMers and the swingers, mainly because of those types that are similar to brats, where they don't go to classes, where they don't go to demos, where they don't read books, where they only go off of something, you know, usually a meme in comparison to actual in-depth studies. Um, they might go to a class or two, but they tend to just wing it in comparison to the background, the research, the learning the nuances so that you're respectful. Because as in, in my particular reference, being a dominant leather female, there are certain protocols and certain etiquettes. And the leather portion, especially, depending on which coast you have studied the research of, depends on how you are in the lifestyle. So on the West Coast, West Coast leather is more biker. It, you know, when you think of certain things as far as the dress, you usually, not always, you usually have a West Coast leather individual who shows up in boots, um, jeans, maybe some leather chaps, and whatever shirt, compared to East Coast leather. East Coast leather is where you wear an outfit. Whether it's whatever outfit you choose, such as this is my outfit right now, Happy Hanukkah, because today is the 6th of December, 2021, and I've got my blue, and I've got a, technically a light color, you know, I've got the light shoes, and so, <laughs> and my hair is so bright, and so I could... <laughs> My outfit kind of looks a little cupcake-ish, so you know my hair is the flame, right? Correct, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, so, and there's glitter. So, you know, that's just, I have my ways of thinking. And so, but in East Coast leather, you show up either in theme type of clothing. So even though this is a video in comparison, this is a, I could show up to an event in this if they had a cupcake theme. I'm a cupcake. <laughs> or, you know, I mean, I guess it's kind of, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, this, this could be, a, I don't really know what type of outfit this would be <laughs> per a theme. But, um, well, unicorn, I guess, there's that. Because, you know, unicorns have bright colors. And, <laughs> and um, glitter, that'd be a theme. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, East Coast leather is usually where you show up in theme. And you don't necessarily have to wear a corset. That's kind of the misconception when it comes to East Coast leather. It's that you show up in theme outfit. So, you know, when you show up to an event, you show up to the event in whatever you particularly feel comfortable in for that particular event. And East Coast leather, you know, you don't always wear a corset though there is the reality that there are in reference to female dominance they tend to wear corsets but they don't always a lot of female dominance on the east coast especially in when you have the female dominance that are in the bdsm lifestyle as well as the swinging lifestyle when they show up to an event usually from what i remember they don't show up in a corset per se. 
to themed events. A lot of times, they actually show up in a non-corseted outfit. Sometimes they do, but it depends on the event, it depends on the location, it depends on the type of location. A whole bunch of things get taken into consideration. And then it also is taken in consideration whether they're gonna be inside the majority of the time or outside. So if they're inside the majority of the time, because you know certain locations have patios or balconies or what have you, they'll dress appropriately for that. But if they're gonna be in and out of the location, they're going to dress according to the weather. And so according to the weather, their outfit will be arranged in that way. And so, whereas West Coast leather, they usually just show up in, and not always, but they usually show up in jeans and a t-shirt, leather, ch leather chaps over their jeans, what have you. There are some who do dress up, but usually they're in the LGBTQP aspects in the West Coast leather, and that's usually I would guesstimate um, that's, that's, that's a different terminology in the West Coast leather for um, the ones that don't usually wear the jeans or the leather chaps in leather aspects of the West Coast. Um, as far as the dominance, the submissives on the other hand, they tend to wear whatever they tend to wear. A lot of times they still do wear jeans and a t-shirt or jeans and the leather chaps, but they do things differently for their outfits and whatnot. Whereas East Coast leather, there are certain similarities. A lot of times actually when it comes to a submissive that is especially in the male capacity, uh, they usually wear a suit, usually. They wear a business suit um, on the East Coast leather and or they wear a pair of slacks and a button-down shirt or a polo shirt. That's usually the East Coast leather version when they go out to events, whereas a female um, dominant will wear however she chooses to wear always. Um, Submissive females, usually when they show up, it is varied. They're kind of more similar in attire to a combination of West Coast leather submissives mixed with a little bit of the LGBTQP. So they, they have their own style but because of how many different types of female submissives in the East Coast leather, they're, they're fairly predictable in certain references. Not being rude, it's the clothing is fairly predictable. Dominant females in East Coast leather, unless they have a specific type of outfit, you cannot ever predict what an East Coast leather dominant female will wear. You can try. You can try. Probably, as I would guesstimate, nine times out of ten, you may have an idea, but you probably would not be able to actually guess what would be worn. And a lot of times, dominant females in East Coast leather, they don't actually show up fully dressed. They usually, most dominant females in East Coast leather, especially the 1980s, 1990s, they do not show up fully in their outfit. Usually they show up about I don't really want to say halfway, so I want to maybe like three-fifths of the way. They're about three-fifths of the way prepared. And then after they get into the event, then they get ready. Then they do their makeup, or if they didn't do it already, and then they get into what they're actually going to wear in comparison to submissives on the East Coast leather 
as far as females are concerned because usually what they wear can be worn anywhere. Dominant females in East Coast leather, not usually, N not always, but not usually capable of being worn without being looked at. And it doesn't matter if you look similar, in, not similar, but similar is in you have tattoos that are in areas that would be noticeable or a different hair color or hairstyle, not necessarily mine, just in that reference. And so in that East Coast, West Coast difference, there's kind of that misconception where, you know, while East Coast tends to be far more put together, when they arrive at an event, they usually, unless it's at night, if it is fully dark out and there is, you know, sunset has already occurred, they might actually show up fully dressed with a long overcoat. <laughs> However, if the sun is still up or it's a while until sunset occurs, don't ever expect an East Coast leather dominant female to show up to an event fully dressed. Mm -mm. It just won't be that way. It won't occur at all in the slightest. No, 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 no. And so that wasn't really necessarily known of me regarding before um, in reference to 2004, even into 2012 or 2013, I would guesstimate in certain references probably this video might also. <laughs> Depending on who you are and how I know you, it might actually surprise you, I don't know. Um, surprise. <laughs> of the BDSM lifestyle, they don't take in consideration of any of the outside areas. So an East Coast leather, in that reference, whether in regards of a submissive or in my case, a dominant, the East Coast leather will take in consideration everything else. They will take in consideration what is nearby. If you are in a neighborhood, if you're in a business area, what businesses are nearby because they don't want to cause a scene. The scenes go on inside, not outside. So the, that sort of aspect, the submissives in regards of not necessarily West Coast leather, but kind of in some ways, they tend to just not that they don't care, it's just it's hot outside all the time on the West Coast, in especially California. So brats, in an overall sort of way, they don't care when it comes to arriving at an event. They will arrive at an event not caring about somebody's neighborhood. So if you go to an, a house party, they're not going to care about your neighbors. They're not going to care if any of your neighbors see them dressed up in that way. They won't make any attempt at all. They won't even try to be modest in the neighborhood. Um, they'll be far more rowdy and that sort of stuff in comparison to dominance especially and, or at minimum, my type of dominant, because I'm very particular. And so, in the reference of brats, I just don't have patience for them because they tend to just not care. They also tend to be extremely childish. So they'll throw temper tantrums over unimportant things. They'll throw temper tantrums over things that they think they have a feeling as far as a right to complain in comparison to a little, which a little is someone who is more childlike 
in thought process, but they're not necessarily brats. They're more curious in certain regards. They want to know, they want to understand, they have questions, and they sometimes, in reference to a lot of littles actually, a lot of littles tend to not necessarily know how to ask certain questions. And that's something I have far more patience for. Because littles, they do have the acknowledgement that they have questions. They do genuinely have that within them to genuinely want to know. Not in a negative way where brats do. Brats want to know in an annoying way so that way they can pester and be a nuisance. That's why I don't like brats. Littles, on the other hand, littles are, they have that submissive aspect where they really do not necessarily only want to know to be able to understand, but they have this innate aspect where their curiosity is where they actually want to have the words to ask. They don't necessarily know how to ask. And there are times where littles are mistaken for brats because of a few different things that are kind of right on that middle line where in certain references, especially when it comes to dominance, if it's not explained to a dominant that they're more like, okay, <laughs> what is it little that you, you need that understanding of? Because usually when it comes to littles, the irony is they've been looked down on in comparison to brats. Brats have unfortunately, and for a while have been thought of higher in comparison to what they actually are. In my opinion, I have to acknowledge this is in my opinion. And so brats tend to think that they're far more important than they are. They usually have the thought process in regards of what I've seen in the lifestyle. They tend to think that because of whoever they're associated with, that all of a sudden they're something special. So whoever their dominant is, they're all of a sudden somebody important in comparison to the fact that it is who they are a submissive brat to that is the of importance aspect. Compared to littles, littles, they don't tend to, it's not that they don't know that they have their importance, there is the problem, it's kind of like sibling rivalry when you really think about it. You know, the brats are the ones that go and do a lot of stuff and everybody is just like, well, that's just, that's just, and, and they don't take the time to actually explain things. They just, oh, that's just, that's, that's just how that. And, and you can tell in the, in the voice now, there is that misconception about littles. Littles, unfortunately, have been categorized in brats because sometimes they tend to have that bratty response because they just really want to know, but again, they don't necessarily know how to ask. And so when they throw certain temper tantrums, they tend to act similar to brats. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of a dichotomy for littles because they don't want to be labeled as brats. And the most littles really cannot stand being called a brat because they're not, especially when they understand the different levels in the BDSM lifestyle. They really, really tend to not like being called a brat because they know what brats actually are. And they also tend to be put into that category where the irony in regards of brats, they hate being called a little. They absolutely cannot stand being called a little. 
It is one of their, they don't mind being called a brat. They actually revel in that. They're, they get proud of that. I mean, again, in my example being my ex-sister-in-law, her eldest daughter, she got proud of being a brat. She's all like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I don't have patience for you. I didn't give birth to you. I don't have time for your type. I will not, nothing, just, I grew up with my biological sister. I don't need that. The irony, my biological sister did get along with my ex-sister-in-law as well as her eldest daughter. The, though that tends to backfire for brats because they're so similar. Because <laughs> when brats get together, unlike littles, littles, when they get together, it's usually they just want to play. They just want to have a good time. They just want to have fun. You know, in comparison to brats. Brats tend to just want to stir up problems be over dramatic, have absolutely no actual ability to give any assistance. They tend to think that they could, but they won't ever acknowledge their weakness unless they're forced to acknowledge their weakness. Whereas littles, they tend to, they tend to, they, they tend to just, they don't necessarily verbalize it, but they tend to acknowledge it in comparison to brats, which I just don't have patience for brats. It just really is something I don't have patience for. And then the thing about brats in the lifestyle is they do have that similar situation as children brats, where if they get caught, they try to pretend that they didn't know what was going on. They try to pretend that they didn't, oh, well, what? What do you mean? What, how, how could you ever look at me for that? Whereas littles, they get very upset. If they do something wrong and they get caught and they didn't know that they did something wrong, they tend to get upset very quickly, very easily. They, they, it, it's a thing whereas brats don't. Brats will, no, this is, and they go into the bratty behavior. <laughs> this is why I don't have patience for brats, because you have to accept responsibility for your choices. You have to acknowledge certain things, and brats tend to not want to acknowledge that, whereas littles, it's not that they don't want to acknowledge it. Sometimes they just didn't even know that that was a thing. That's usually the case when it comes to littles in the BDSM lifestyle. That's why I have far more patience for littles than I do brats. There's so many other reasons, but that's a brief-ish, <laughs> very brief example of and it, it, in my opinion, I wouldn't know officially, I would guesstimate in reference to brats, they just didn't ever get the discipline, that's why they seek that. That's why they enjoy that masochistic situation where when they get in trouble, they try to balk back in comparison to taking responsibility because inevitably they know there's some sort of attention in comparison. Whereas littles, they tend to not want that attention. They don't want to get in trouble. They, they genuinely, you know, if, if, they, if something goes awry, they tend to, well, what do we do? What do we do in comparison? to brats who try to only propel everybody else into trouble in comparison and not ever acknowledging any weakness, not ever taking responsibility. And even when they're caught, caught, fully caught, they tend to still balk back 
that's my experience from what I've learned from brats in regards to the difference in littles. Where littles, when they get caught, they tend to want to hide. <laughs> they tend to, 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 well, what? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's what they tend to do. I've noticed this. <laughs> I've noticed this, and in the swinging community, littles, unfortunately in some ways, again, similar to the BDSM lifestyle, they tend to get lumped in with brats when they're not brats at all. <laughs> they, they can throw temper tantrums, but not the same way brats do. And so, in the lifestyle, littles tend to just, they, they're just softer, they're kinder. Whereas brats, they don't care. They don't care what they mess up. They don't care who they hurt. Just think of childhood. I mean, realistically, because especially when you take in consideration certain aspects, think about childhood. Think about who was bratty in your elementary school. And then take a look at who identifies themselves as a brat and see if you can find any biological adult portion in those references compared to littles. Littles tend to be quieter. <laughs> they don't, and I don't mean that they don't speak, they just tend to, they, so there's rugrats, okay? Those who know rugrats, the, the cartoon rugrats, littles, are kind of like the Rugrats. Brats are kind of like Angelica. And I would guesstimate that that would make so much easier sense in those references. So like brats in adult type of ways would kind of, so for those who know Daria, that particular one, brats tend to be like Quinn and Quinn's friends. That's, that's, that's the teenage version of brats. Whereas littles, <laughs> I wouldn't really put them in the Daria category, mainly because Daria was older in that reference. So you have the Quinn reference for brats though. <laughs> And those who have been seasoned in the lifestyle and know a thing or two, they kind of tend, male or female, to have a bit of a Daria view. They tend to be more similar to Daria, especially the dominance. They tend to have that Daria type of personality. They kind of may have a little bit of Jane in there but they're more similar to Daria. I would guesstimate, but in the review of, of Littles in comparison to Bratz, um, I would guesstimate a lot of Littles, they may have had a little, <laughs> pun intended, they may have had a little too much exposure in reference to their life. And while they know they and in varying degrees, in varying references, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were well known. It, it just might mean that in their family they had a lot of pressure and, you know, they, they just want something smaller <laughs> to deal with. They want some responsibility, just not all that much. <laughs> they, they, they tend to, they want to still be able to play, but they just prefer rules. They, they tend to want to know what, what the boundaries are, whereas brats don't care about boundaries. Brats, you know, again, think of Angelica, don't care, don't have any concern about that. And then, similarly to Angelica, when getting caught in comparison to genuine feelings, they just throw a temper tantrum 
If I, I would guesstimate those who have been around brats and littles in the ways that I haven't been around too, too many, acknowledging that, but those who have, who's, who've had that well-seasoned aspect could probably, because even though I've officially only been in the lifestyle since 2004, admittedly on and off though, since 2004, and then adding the realistic aspects of the mid to late 1980s because of, well, be honest, on the time frame, the year, the decade before of the 70s, there was still some residual stuff that went on. So I was still around it because it was considered acceptable in the 1970s. And so <laughs> in the mid to late 1980s into the 1990s, especially in New Jersey and New York City more specifically, I mean, yes, there's Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but especially the five boroughs and New Jersey, I had far more exposure in that way to the different levels up. Yes, over time, it was more so in 2004 onward, but a lot of people in the lifestyle probably only looked at me and were like, oh, you're just, a no, 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 no. I have, I have far more of a background than you might have ever taken into consideration. And that's fine. I, I don't make assumptions of people. I just have the background that I have. And so I'm more open. And that's why I don't make assumptions. That's why I tend to take a step back before ever taking a step forward. Um, it's something that I learned very young for other reasons, but it's something that I took into consideration, especially when it comes to the lifestyle. So now in reference to the difference of BDSM and swinging, BDSM, you can show up to an event in the BDSM way, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a themed event. It could just be whichever group. And if an individual decides that they want to show up in that brat way or in that whichever label they choose, in my opinion, the way I view it in comparisons for a psychological evaluation sort of review in the year of 2021, I would view the BDSMers, especially the ones that not going on outfits, going on how they themselves as themselves show up to events. I would give the psychological evaluation that it's more similar to a multiple personality disorder because of the choices to go from one event to another event in the different what have yous. I mean, unless you're just a dominant or you're just whatever label and no matter what, wherever you go, whatever event, you're the exact same person. It doesn't matter what the theme is. It doesn't matter what the group is. It doesn't matter. You just show up and you are yourself. And that's it. It doesn't matter what outfit you're wearing, you're still you. You might be a little bit more, take a step back if you're new to a group, but you're still yourself nonetheless. And so that's kind of a thing that I think is an issue with swingers because swingers, when you show up to an event, whether you are in a relationship or not, you are looked at at the minimum of being truthful to who you are because of the intimate nature referencing the swinging community in comparison to the BDSM community. In the BDSM community, the only time certain things that occur in a swinging community are at the point of what's known as a dark party, comparatively, or an edge play party, or in those capacities, fully different, where swinging, it's just that way all the time. 100% of the time, that's just it. 
There's no, there's no difference. It's not that it's dark. It's not that it's whatever. It's just, that's how it is. That's from what I've noticed over the decades. <laughs> the irony, despite my time frame and the lifestyle, I am a prude. <laughs> I also went through the dominant mentor program and part of homework was learning things during boot camp. And after all that research, I was already a prude. I got called a square when I was growing up in New Jersey as far as certain discussions. I accepted that. I was perfectly okay with that because I knew what that meant. You knew where the boundaries were. That's the way I took it. <laughs> there was no question, nothing at all, which is irony in reference to um, swinging because you knew exactly who I am. <laughs> there was no mistaking that. The only difference is if I was new to an area or to a group, and that's it. And it's not really a difference. It's more in the... I'm not here to step on anybody's toes. I'm not here to disrespect anybody. I'm not here to take anyone's light away. That's not who I am. That might be what some other people might think. That's not how I am. I, and so if in reference to the years of 2008 more specifically or 2009, uh, through 2012, yeah, okay, I did a lot of modeling. I explained the reasons why. But if you met me in person, comparatively to the modeling, this how I am in regards of the, the video stuff, I would guesstimate more people would probably say that that's pretty much how I am normally. Um, writing is very different because that's um, the, in certain ways it is therapeutic to me. I did have a journal when I was a child and so I did a lot of writing but I also did it in a different way. I was <laughs> extremely mathematical and extremely scientific. And I had done a lot of studies in reference to religion. And so there were all these alchemical kind of ways that when it came to my, what would be considered journals, um, you wouldn't really know. <laughs> you, <laughs> you might think I was doing homework. <laughs> and in some ways I may have been. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily know because of how many classes I had been involved with, how much I actually had read. So you could look at my journals back as a child, especially my handwritten ones, because that's what it was back then. I didn't ever have an electronic journal. And so that sort of stuff, <laughs> you, you might think that, and then it would take years before you'd ever look into that. That probably um, makes sense in some ways now. <laughs> However, um, going back to the, the situations of swinging in comparison to BDSM, this is the reason in a lot of ways I tend to lean towards the swinging aspect because of that genuinity, because of that requirement where you actually, and not everybody requires it, but there kind of is. There's still certain levels of BDSM in swinging. So for example, people who have been in the swinging community for a while, you could see it with certain males or females in this reference. If they've been with someone multiple times and they show up and they're like, you in the back in 10 minutes, that sort of thing, that's very bdsm in a different way, in a swinging capacity, comparatively 
to the BDSM ways. Because even in the BDSM ways, as well as swinging ways, you do have to have certain negotiations that occur. That is a mandatory for the consensual aspect in comparison to brats, where brats don't care about consent. I would guesstimate that more people who could evaluate that would be able to tell that brats really tend to just not care about consent when it's the most important factor fully the most important factor. The second most important factor is truth, because you have to be. You have to be able to verbalize what it is that you're looking for. That's why there's the difference in regards of littles, because they're acknowledging that they don't necessarily know the words. And so that's where they seek that. In comparison to brats, where they tend to go in and be disruptive in a extremely abrupt way where they tend to have the ways they choose and don't take in consideration anybody else at all that's again my perception of so I hope that this kind of ish informative ish <laughs> YouTube video thing has made more sense to a bit of a clarification because I know that there are those who can go back and forth between the BDSM and the swinging communities because they understand that and there are those that I would guesstimate would prefer to have that understanding and knowledge whichever community of whether you're in the BDSM community and swingers show up, or vice versa, where you're in the swinging community and BDSMers show up. The problem is, is you have to be willing to communicate. It's, it's mandatory. And so that's kind of, I guess, in some ways an oddity, um, especially in regards of scuba diving. You know, in BDSM, you tend to have, if you're a submissive, you tend to have something such as a ball gag in your mouth if you're a submissive. I am not a submissive. I am a dominant. <laughs> Let me clarify that. So in regards of scuba divers, they could be whichever capacity of. However, if they're accustomed to having a binky in their mouth or their regulator, um, it's the communication that's extremely important. And with the millennial aspects, where so many more people have gotten accustomed to texting, have gotten accustomed to only doing things in the type format, where they're not accustomed to actually speaking, where they're not accustomed to actually being capable of having a discussion. And that, I wouldn't be surprised, has something to do with how they were raised. And so here, here's a piece of technology, here, go play with that instead of talking. That's not how I raised my son and my daughter. I raised my son and my daughter to speak with me. Situations that occurred are what situations that occurred. I did everything I could as best as I could. So when, in reference of the lifestyle stuff, when I was involved, not them, but keeping in mind that my son and my daughter eventually were going to be biological adults, whereas I know that there are some people who, when they have a child, they think that their child is going to remain that age forever. In their memories, yes. In their thoughts, yes. You will remember when your child was toddling around and doing certain things. You'll remember when your child, what have you. When I had my son and my daughter, I knew that they were going to grow up. I knew that there was going to be a point in time I had 
wished until they were 18, but I had a feeling. I had hoped that I'd be able and capable to make sure that there were ways that my son and my daughter knew that I did everything I could for them as best as I could to explain where I could um, so that way they knew that no matter what, they weren't necessarily involved with certain things, of course, because of age, because of whatever it was, but I knew that they were going to grow up. I knew that at some point in time, they might have certain individuals in their life that would introduce them to certain things, and I wanted to make sure that my son and my daughter were as safe as possible. I wanted my son and my daughter to be educated. I didn't want them to be ignorant. I didn't want them to have that as a problem. I wanted them to be able to make well-informed decisions. And in turn, knowing that they were going to grow up going to school, wherever they were going to go to school, meet whoever they were going to meet, what my preference is in comparison to situations, nonetheless, I wanted to make sure that my son and my daughter were well equipped to be able to verbalize in a mature way. And no matter what, I wanted to make sure of that I wanted them when they were old enough, if they knew people that needed assistance and they could genuinely help, they'd have the ability to verbalize it. In comparison to what I was seeing growing up, especially in the 1990s, whereas later on in other areas of the United States of America and inevitably the world, here's a piece of technology. And what do you do with it? Figure it out. No, 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 no. I wanted my son and my daughter to be able to have that. And also knowing that the technology was going to be more common, I wanted to make sure no matter what, my son and my daughter always knew that I did everything I could to remain modest. And once they're 18, which both of them are, they're both above the age of 18 years old biologically. Yes, your mom is older than you biologically. Don't let my outfit fool you. <laughs> However, I'm still modest. And I know that there are other situations, such as those brat types. Be smarter than them, please. Please do. Avoid those brat types as much as you possibly can. <laughs> it's a preference of mine, because I don't have time for brats. I don't have patience for brats, and I just won't ever like a brat. That's, that's, the, that's the reality. I just, I won't, I just don't have the patience for it. <laughs> I really don't, it's a thing. And um, it is what it is. I have more patience for littles, by far, because littles just don't know any better. And they, they acknowledge that, where brats seem to think that they know everything. And only when a brat essentially realizes that they've been being a brat, can there ever be that understanding for themselves? That's the only time that they're capable of actually evaluating themselves. Because once a brat, and I haven't actually ever seen this, this is just a, this is just a guess. Once a brat is fully made aware that they have just been being a brat, in comparison to littles, a brat will most likely, in my guesstimation, throw some more temper tantrums, be upset a whole bunch more, um, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, you know, that sort of stuff. Just, I don't want to sort of just, uh, just forget this, this is stupid, and da da da, and wasted this, and rawr, and whatever. <laughs> which is kind of what littles do, but in a different way. Because <laughs> littles inevitably 
and those who are patient with littles, they tend to, well, if it's needed, it's still needed, it doesn't change. If brats are just, yeah, no, I think, and that sort of thing, and then they throw their temper tantrums, and they try to be all big man on campus sort of thing, and just look at what I can do, and rah, 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 rah while still being a brat and not acknowledging the problems. So when brats inevitably I would guesstimate because there has to be a point when they realize that they've been a brat this whole time. Um, when they have that recognition of their situations as to what they have caused in comparison to earned recognition, I would guesstimate they probably would throw another temper tantrum or two, maybe three, because they're brats in comparison. And then when they realize the actual impacts that they've had in the negative way, then I would guess that they could have the point where they look at what littles do and don't necessarily want to acknowledge being a little because, yeah, because that's how they view that, I would guess. And so that's an evaluation that brats have to do for themselves. And if, if, at a point in time, because I have yet to meet a brat who has ever actually acknowledged that they were being a brat. That's kind of a, <laughs> I have, I, I'm, and I don't mean in the, where they're proud of being a brat. I mean where they acknowledge that they've been a brat, but in a little type of way, where they actually are genuinely remorseful, genuinely take in consideration certain things, genuinely do an internal evaluation of where they've actually been a brat, where they actually assumed however they chose to assume, wherever they had gone, whichever pathway up. I haven't, uh, that would be something new to me. <laughs> that would be a first. I can acknowledge that would definitely be a first to ever meet a brat that would actually take that time, actually internally evaluate things, actually acknowledge that they didn't know any better because you know most brats will be i know this i did that and rah, 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 that sort of stuff that would be a first <laughs> that would be <laughs> i i don't know i have i i, I mean i'm sure it could possibly happen <laughs> Kind of similar in scuba diving. I know better than to hold my breath. <laughs> I'm not saying that can't happen. I'm not saying that hasn't happened. What I am saying is I haven't ever had that experience. <laughs> had someone who's been a brat and ever acknowledged their whatever and where they assumed and all that and I haven't ever had that. <laughs> I, have a, I have a difficult time imagining that. It's just funny to me because I just... <laughs> That hasn't ever occurred, and not in not in my lifetime, not in, not in any of my experiences. I haven't ever, ever, ever had that. That would be hilarious, though, because I just can't actually envision how that would look. So, because of the way I am, it's just well, <laughs> sure, <laughs> whatever, sure, okay. <laughs> Whereas again, littles tend to just, you know, they tend to just, you know, <laughs> they, 
they tend to self-evaluate more often than a brat would, obviously. So uh, that's my opinion in reference to the BDSM and the swinger aspect where swingers automatically think of BDSMers in that brat category. Where, uh, and that, that's kind of, and, and that's kind of what I, I, I have an opinion of regarding swingers thinking that all BDSMers are in that brat category because they don't necessarily understand or even know the difference regarding the different leather types, the different, um, they might know of the different labels to a degree, but because of how many labels there have been, that's kind of where I have the opinion that I would guesstimate that most swingers would automatically have the sensation, well, okay, that you're just that. And it would take essentially somebody who'd be different in all sorts of capacities that would bring that forward. So that way, swingers, they still would have the ability to discern, you know, for themselves what's more comfortable for them, but having more of an open mind in comparison because who knows what their normalcy has been in reference to the BDSM lifestyle. And then with the amount of, what is it, the adult film industry portions, having that kind of dichotomy with the <laughs> stuff as far as that millennial stuff, I could see where s swingers might have that, well, are you, are you, what, you, you're, well, what, in that sort of way. In comparison where I could see, and I would guesstimate this has happened more often than not, where if a swinger going into the BDSM lifestyle be like, um, <laughs> no, I'm not that, 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 and then kind of in certain ways being confused by it because of how many different labels, how many different types, the different backgrounds, the, and, and I could see where swingers would be like, well, I would like a psychological evaluation on this, 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 and this, because I want to know why you would think that would be acceptable. And I want to know why you would think that is normal. And I want to know why you would do this. And I want to, I would, I would guess, I would guess. <laughs> In comparison, so you guys have a good one. Enjoy your day. Happy Hanukkah and happy holidays in general. Merry Christmas, happy new year. So irony that this is the eighth day and glitter. <laughs> Enjoy your day. <laughs>